Let's see. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, and welcome you all to GLOMCON today. I'm Dia Wagesbeck from McGovern Medical School at UT Health in Houston. Uh, today's session is going to be a roundtable discussion. It's a collaborative session between GLOMCON and the YNP. Uh, and this idea of creating a transatlantic initiative in nephrology education uh, came from Dr. Ali Poyenmayer and Dr. Kate Stevens. So today um, we have our speaker, Dr. Maria Papias, who will be uh, leading us today. She's from the Department of Medical Informatics and in Amsterdam Public Health Research Institute, um, part of the ERA EDTA registry at Amsterdam University Medical Center. She will be speaking on the older adult receiving renal replacement therapy studies from the ERA EDTA registry. Uh, we will also have a panel uh, of experts to join us here to uh, comment and, and discuss this topic once the, or her presentation is over. And we are joined by Dr. Patrick Finn, Associate Professor and Chief Physician of Dialysis Units at Helensky University Hospital in Helensky, Finland. Dr. Kitty Yeager, Professor of Medical Informatics and Kidney Epidemiology at the ERA EDTA Registry of Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Dr. Fergus Kasky, a consultant senior lecturer, of Population Health Sciences, University of Bristol Medical Director, UK Renal Registry Honorary Consultant Nephrologist at North Bristol NHS Trust, and Dr. Daniel Weiner, Associate Professor at Tufts University School of Medicine. So I will be moderating today's session along with Prabir Baxi out of Russian of Chicago, uh, and let's get started. So, um, again, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, everybody. So, over the next 15, 20 minutes, I'd like to talk to you about the older adult receiving RRT uh, in the form of dialysis or transplant in Europe. And firstly, I'd just like to explain what the ERA EDTA registry is and what it does. And um, then I'll run through why we've chosen to to focus on the older adult, who during this talk is defined as anybody over the age of 65. And then I'll show you some numbers detailing how many older adults are receiving RRT in Europe. Thereafter, we'll move on to look at their survival. And all the data that I'll present today comes from studies using data from the ERA EDTA registry. Um, and finally, we'll move on to the roundtable discussion with our panelists. So firstly, what is the ERA EDTA registry? Well, it's a registry that collects data on patients undergoing dialysis or with a renal transplant in European countries and countries bordering the Mediterranean Sea. Um, in 2000, well, last year we collected the data from 2016, and you can see on this map we collected data from 36 countries highlighted on here, um, and that was a total of 600 and, a coverage of 677 million people, which is about 80% of Europe's population. And the countries highlighted in red supply us with individual patient level data and those in orange with aggregated data. So with the data, we, we write uh, the annual reports, scientific papers, there's an introduction to epidemiology course, and there's uh, various learning and teaching opportunities. And I recommend you have a look at the website for links to the studies written by the registry and a whole array of educational material. So why have we decided to focus on the older adult? Well, because the majority of nephrology patients are older adults. The incidence of RRT, so that's the number of new starters to renal replacement therapy, is highest in those over the age of 65. If we look at the data for the 2016 annual report, you can see that for every 1 million adults over the age of 75, sorry, over the age of 65, um, or between 65 and 74, I should say, 304 of them started renal replacement therapy. And if we look at those older, so over the age of 75, 358 in every million started renal replacement therapy. And you can see as you go down the bar chart that the younger the patient or the younger the person, the fewer that starts renal replacement therapy. 
So overall, 52% of the people that started renal replacement therapy in these countries in 2016 were over the age of 65. And if you look at how this translates to real numbers, that's about 43,000 people that started RRT who were over the age of 65 in these countries. Now, for all the um, studies I'll show you, there'll be a little map in the right-hand corner, and that just shows you which countries were included in each study. So the other interesting feature about the incidence, how many people start renal replacement therapy each year, is to look at the trends over time. And this, is a fig this figure comes from a study we published a few years back, looking at the trends over a 10-year period. And you can see from the top three colored lines that most of the people starting RRT were um, elderly. But the other thing that you may be able to notice is that over the 10 year period, the incidence declined for every age group uh, in, in sort of terms of per million population, except for those that were over age 85 in that age group the incidence only stabilized. So the numbers I've shown you so far are for all countries included in the registry combined. But what's interesting to see is how the incidence varies between countries. So this figure comes from our 2012 annual report. Now at this size, the, the figure isn't very legible, but what you can hopefully see is that for each country or region, there are two bars. The black bar is the incidence for patients aged 65 to 74, and the gray bar is the incidence for patients aged 75 and over. And what's very clear to see is that there's a vast difference between the incidence in these two age groups between the countries and regions. For example, in Dutch-speaking Belgium, the incidence is 900. In Austria, it's about 450. And in Finland, it's just 220 per million um, age-related population for over 75-year-olds. Now, using data from our registry, we had a, a, a visiting researcher from Finland who recently looked for uh, explanations into these differences in incidence. So, uh, they looked at how many patients aged over 75 commencing RRT between 2010 and 2015 in various European countries, how that varied. What was interesting to see, there was a six-fold difference in the incidence of RRT for this age group. Now, even in the younger patients, so those less than 75, there was a difference, but this difference was only twofold. So they went on to look as to why there was the difference in the incidence. And what they couldn't do is explain it in terms of country wealth or life expectancy or comorbidity. So these are two, um, two figures taken from that study. And you can see that neither life expectancy or GDP is related to the incidence uh, in, in a particular country. So we know the number of older adults starting RRT varies but we don't really know why. And perhaps our panelists will be able to give us an idea on this later. So if we move on and ask what comorbidities are our older patients commencing RRT with? Now this is a study that was performed by the registry and a visiting researcher from Uruguay. And they looked at the prevalence of comorbidities in all adults, commencing RRT between 2005 and 2014. And as a sub-analysis, they also looked at patients over the age of 65. And um, of course, older adults, which is shown here on the right panel, had more comorbidities than the younger uh, incident patients shown here on the um, left. So by 2014, 40% of our patients over the age of 65 had a comorbidity of diabetes, a third had a comorbidity of ischemic heart disease, and a fifth had either peripheral vascular disease, malignancy, or cardiovascular disease. 
And what was also interesting to see was that over a 10 year period, the prevalence of diabetes and malignancy as a, a comorbidity in the new starters to RRT in this age group increased, whereas the percentage with cardiovascular disease decreased. So we're seeing more older patients commencing RRT with either diabetes or malignancy as a comorbidity. So that was information related to the incidence, but what about the prevalence? So the prevalence is how many people are receiving RRT in a particular area on the 31st of December of the year you're looking at. So again here, this is the 2016 annual report data. And you can see that for every million adults aged 65 to 74, almost 2,100 were receiving uh, um, renal replacement therapy. And for those aged over, um, sorry, and that's in comparison to those aged 20 to 44, where only 364 in every million were receiving renal replacement therapy. And how does this um, translate in terms of the whole RRT population? Well, 42% of our RRT population in 2016 were over the age of 65. And in real numbers, if we say that nearly 564,000, so over half a million people were receiving RRT in 2016 in these countries, about 237 of them were pensioners over the age of 65 years. Okay, so what sort of RRT are these older adults receiving? Well, I'm sure it will come as no surprise to most of you to know that most of the older adults receiving RRT in Europe are doing so in the form of hemodialysis, two thirds in fact. About 30% are living with a transplant and only 6% receiving a peritoneal dialysis as a treatment option. And again, if we look at the younger group, well, this is reversed. 60% are living with a transplant, a third uh, are receiving hemodialysis, and just 4% are receiving peritoneal dialysis. So, okay, the majority of older adults are commencing RRT with hemodialysis but what sort of access are they, uh, do they have? And this was a study published by the registry in 2014. And the primary aim of this study was to look at the trends in the incidence of prevalence and survival by vascular access. And uh, one of the questions that the uh, group asked in this study was what was the likelihood of commencing dialysis with an AV fistula as opposed to a central line. And um, now it should be noted that the overall use of, uh, of fistulas in all age groups decreased between 2005 and 2009 by about 10%. And the increase and the proportion using uh, central venous catheters actually uh, increased by 10%. So what we did see, or what, what they saw, was that there was a big international variation between the countries, again. And there were two groups that were least likely to start renal replacement therapy with uh, a fistula. And that was women and patients aged over 80 years. Now, you can clearly see in this table taken from that study that as the age of the new starter increased, the odds of them starting dialysis with a fistula decreased. So it was 33% lower in those aged over 80 years. And if we looked at the, the prevalence, so this was new starters, but what about people that were receiving dialysis in this time frame? Again, a similar thing. As the age of the, uh, the patient receiving dialysis increased, the odds of them uh, dialyzing on a or with a fistula decreased. And why is this important? Well, because mortality, be that all cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, or infectious mortality, um, decreases in patients or is lower in patients using a fistula as opposed to patients using a um, 
uh, a line. So if we move on to look at survival in a little more, bit more detail, this table was taken from our 2016 annual report and it shows the survival at 90 days, one year, two years and five years for patients that started dialysis between 2007 and 2011. And again, it's divided by age group. And if we just focus at the last column, so five year survival, you can see as you go down the column that as the patient age increases, the five year survival decreases. So for those aged 65 to 74, less than half, so about 41% are uh, alive at five years. Whereas for those aged 75, less than a quarter, 24, are alive by five years follow-up. Now there's better survival for uh, transplant recipients in this age group. So uh, this first, this table here is for deceased donors, a uh, deceased donor transplant recipients, again transplanted between 2007 and 11. And uh, this time, the older recipients are grouped as everybody over the age of 65 because there are fewer in the older age group. And again, if you look at five year survival, it decreases with age. Uh, and for those aged over 65, nearly three quarters, so 75% are alive at five years. And the survival for living donor transplant recipients is somewhat better. And for this age group over 65, 82% are still alive for five years follow up. So we were intrigued given the improved survival outcomes for the older transplant recipient, what proportion of older adult dialysis patients in Europe that were aged 75 to 84 received a transplant. So we looked um, specifically at those in this age group that were transplanted between 2005 and 2014. Now, so in answer to the question, what proportion of these dialysis patients received or had access to a kidney transplant? The answer is not many. We found that this was at best 4% in Norway and, and various Spanish regions and down to zero or nearly zero in Slovenia, Greece and Denmark. Uh, we did notice though that overall the access to transplantation increased over the 10 year period from yeah, 0.3% up to just under 1% in 2014, so really small numbers here. And then we looked at the allocation, so we said of all the transplants allocated in a country, uh, how many of those are allocated to patients aged 75 to 84. And again, we saw this was less than 1% in 2003 and rose to about 3% in 2014. Now, interestingly, um, most, most uh, donor kidneys came from deceased donors and the median donor age increased. It was 67 years in 2005 and up to 77 years in 2014. So this is a rare event in this age group. But what is their survival? Well, the survival at five years follow-up in terms of patient survival shown in the upper panel was 67%. And the unadjusted graph survival by five years follow-up shown in the lower panel was just 57%. But there was a temporal trend towards improvement with time. Okay, so when it comes to treatment options for end-stage dialysis, end-stage renal disease, there are broadly speaking four options. There's hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, um, conservative care and transplantation. Now the ERA EDTA registry is an RRT registry, so we don't have data on the number of patients managed conservatively or their survival outcomes. And I mean, these, these survival outcomes are very difficult to establish. Now there is this guideline written by the ERBP group, um, clinical practice guideline on the management of older patients with CKD. And um, I recommend you have a look at it because it does give you some idea as to how to um, assess your patients for deciding which treatment option 
is best for them. There are some studies in progress which will hopefully shed some light on uh, which treatment option for older adults. And I'll quickly highlight just two of these ongoing studies. The first study is the EQUAL study, um, which stands for European Quality Study on the Treatment in Advanced CKD. Now, this is an observational study that's coordinated by the registry and its key aims involve around learning more about patients aged over 65 with advanced CKD. And some of the main things they're looking into are how should doctors take the signs and symptoms of patients into account uh, in their decision making progress if and when to start dialysis? What's the best method to determine kidney function in patients over the age of 65? And what do patients consider important in deciding if and when to start dialysis? And some of their preliminary data have already been published. Now, the second study I wanted to just mention was uh, comes out of the UK. It's called the Prepare for Kidney uh, Care Study. And this is a randomized controlled clinical trial which compares two pathways. And that being either preparing patients for what they call responsive management or mm -hmm. preparing patients for renal dialysis. And the target population are those aged over the age of 80 known to renal services or those younger aged 65 to 79 with either a reduced uh, a WHO performance score or a comorbidity score of above two. Uh, and their aim is to establish the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of preparing for responsive management compared to preparing for dialysis. Uh, recruitment's currently underway and will continue to next year, but it will be a couple of years at least until we have uh, some answers from what was likely to be a very fruitful study. So just in summary, um, we've seen that the older adult who we define as over the age of 65 makes up more than half of new, uh, new starters to RRT. And the incidence varies substantially between the European countries and we don't really know why. 40% uh, of new starters have diabetes as a comorbidity and a third have ischemic heart disease, with a, a fifth having peripheral vascular disease, malignancy, or cardiovascular disease. The older, almost two thirds of the older adults begin RRT on hemodialysis and just 6% on PD, and they're less likely to commence hemodialysis with a fistula. And the survival is about 41%. Uh, on dialysis for those aged 65 to 74 by five years follow-up and just 24% for those over the age of 75. And the question as always remains, which older adults should we prepare and commence on RRT? So um, thank you for your attention. I guess now move on to the panelists. I'll hand you back. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. I think that, um, you know, I think to first start with the panelists, maybe we could get you guys to uh, discuss a little bit about, you know, you described just nicely in the summary, again, the mortality and, you know, incidence of these patients. It's increasing, but don't have clear information from this data. Some of the U.S. literature states, you know, increase in cardiovascular, uh, less, I'm sorry, less cardiovascular mortality is increasing our population and age of our population with increasing comorbidities. And maybe that's why we're seeing so many more patients needing, needing dialysis or, or potentially qualifying for dialysis towards the, their later years. And so if you guys could maybe comment from the, from the data side and then from what you see clinically, um, and I'll let you, you know, when, whoever wants to start can go ahead and start. I can start. This is Dan. So, I mean, just like you said, in the U.S., I mean, we're seeing very similar trends where you have the most rapidly growing parts of the dialysis population are older adults, ages 65, or even getting into, I think, the octogenarians, I think, are actually the most rapidly growing part of the population. And in large part, that's due to cardiovascular disease success. I think people are not dying as much or as early of their heart disease. They're not dying as early of cancer. Um, so people are living longer and then are faced with the difficult decision as to whether or not to start um, kidney replacement therapy at a fairly advanced age. Um, 
And that's really been a paradigm shift, I think, in the last 20 years or so um, in dialysis, um, at least in the U.S. And, and seemingly from the data that we just saw um, in Europe as well. And Fergus Kasky here from the UK. I mean, I think uh, that's, that's something we've explored in the UK as well. If, if that's the case, though, why do we see a fall in mortality um, and sorry, take on rate in the 65 to 75 and 75 to 85, which I think is what Maria showed. And the increase was really only in the 85 plus. Is that right, Maria? Um, and so I think if, if we were, so a lot of that cardiovascular uh, death avoidance and so on, uh, you would expect to see that in the 65 to 85 too. I think, so there, there's, in terms of survival among all dialysis patients, I think all patients, at least in the US, who are doing dialysis are living a little bit longer. And, and you can see that most clearly in the fact that while well, the incidence rate had flattened out for a while, the prevalence rates of, of dialysis kept increasing. Um, pretty much at every age group. So I, I, I think where the real improvements though in mortality have been in the non-dialysis population and non-dialysis feeds dialysis. Yeah, that's what I saw. I was talking about the RRT incidence rate, which in the UK has, and in Europe, Maria showed, has actually been falling in the 65 to 75 and 75 to 85, which I think reflects is despite an improvement in cardiovascular mortality in the general population in, in Europe. So it's really only in the over 85 where, where we're seeing a continuing increase in RRT incidence in, in Europe. So it's slightly, slightly at odds with, with what, what you're seeing in the U.S., I think. Yeah, so the incidence rate in the U.S. just started to pick up again. It had flattened off for a while. Um, but again, th those are relative to the overall population. So the prevalence is up and the most rapidly growing portion of the dialysis population are older rather than younger adults. So is that, uh, is that because we are doing a better job in keeping CKD patients longer alive or is that because we have a lower threshold to start elderly on dialysis as we had a decade ago? I, I could comment also on this. I think it's very interesting to, to look at the differences between between countries in, in incidence of RRT in Europe, as Maria, there there has been a six, we, we observe a six-fold difference in, in the incidence of RRT um, in the oldest age group, about 75 years. And and uh, it has to be, be uh, has to be due to, to differences in, in taking these patients uh, onto to dialysis between the countries and, and uh, I'm working in Finland and as Maria showed the, one of the lowest incidences um, are, are, are seen in, in Finland and, and to me it seems a little bit difficult to, to, to understand how, how there is in some countries can be a four or five or six fold uh, incidence um, but, but um, um, what we do in Finland uh, which might be different to, to some other countries is that we we start di dialysis quite late when the estimated GFR is maybe six, seven, or eight, uh, and and it's very mm -hmm. that the, the the estimated GFR is, is um, ten or twelve. So, so we don't look very much at, at creatinine. We we look more at, at how the patient uh, is is uh, doing and, and um, symptoms, and then uh, maybe fluid fluid overload or uremic symptoms. Uh, and and uh, maybe we try to treat more more life uh, quality of life than 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 to bring a few more months or years years of, of life expectancy. So can I ask a couple of things? Um, do you think there's any cultural aspect to the differences in incidence between the countries? Do you think that? Can you, can you speak up a little bit? Sorry, can you hear me now? Is that better? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, do, do, so first of all, do you think there's any cultural aspect between the European countries? So do you think there's any reason that patients perhaps decide that they don't want to have dialysis difference between the countries? And then second of all, um, you might not have this, but I wondered, is there any data on withdrawal? So patients who start dialysis over 65, is there any data on how many of them withdraw and at what time point they withdraw? We, we didn't study, uh, we in the registry did not study um, anything on withdrawal of dialysis. 
I know, however, that um, in the DOP study, they have done this. And what they showed was in that the southern part of Europe, there was um, withdrawal was very rare. Whereas in the northern parts of Europe and in uh, especially in the UK, the number of patients withdrawing from dialysis was much higher. Maybe in the UK we're starting people that we perhaps should not be starting. Sorry, could you speak up a bit? So I'm, well, I wonder if maybe <coughs> in the UK we start people on dialysis who maybe we should we should think twice about starting. Well, Kate, I think it's not that many years since we were being told in the UK we didn't start enough people on dialysis. Um, so uh, I, I, I don't know. I think it, a lot of it is coding, though. So um, there, I know that there's a lot of interest in the uh, um, consistency of when people classify someone as having withdrawn and death, death due to withdrawal. Is it within 24 hours or 48 hours or 36 hours? So I think one of the differences may be that there may be cultural differences in when it's acceptable to code someone as having stopped withdrawn, withdrawn treatment. So I, I, and I know Wim van Leeson is looking with, with the polls and with the UK at, at setting up some work to try and standardise the way we define withdrawal of dialysis for cause of death purposes. Yeah, it's, it's the but same it's a, thing in the US. A question. And, yeah, it's the same thing in the US. It, it's withdrawal accounts for between 13 and 18 percent of all dialysis deaths. Um, depending on how you define it, but then people are defining this very ad hoc. So somebody can say, be in an ICU, stop dialysis, stop everything, stop pressors, and then they die, and some people will define that as withdrawal. Um, others won't. So there's a lot of heterogeneity in, in what's even meant by that term. Whereas I think classically what people appreciate as being withdrawal is when someone says, okay, I've had enough with dialysis, not getting the quality or not able to accomplish my goals. Next Tuesday is going to be my last day. Um, and, and I think that's probably a, a fraction of that around 15% of withdrawal in the US. So another thing that's relevant is, is the EGFR at start. And um, Steve Rosansky has been coordinating some work between the Canadian, US, French, Australian and UK registries. And there, there are big differences in, in the EGFR at start um, between the countries. So in Canada, um, people starting HD, it's 10.2 mils per minute, whereas in, in the UK, people starting uh, hemodialysis at 7.7. So, so although that's just a couple of mils, there's, there's going to be big effects of that on RRT incidence between, between countries for comparison, for example. That's, that's sort of being worked up for publication at the minute. Uh, and along the lines um, of when to start planning for it and that type of thing. Uh, one thing that the National Kidney Foundation in the U.S. has kind of come out with in their Kidoki guidelines was uh, what they call plan. So patient life then followed by an access plan. And one of the questions that's come up in the in our chat as well has been about access choices. And, you know, we've all been in this particular first mentality and these older adults, should we be, should we be discussing this differently and choosing access a little differently? And so uh, if we could start with you, Dr. Kasky, if you can start commenting on, on how you approach that and, and some of your thoughts and we'll go from there. Well, I was interested in, in Maria's presentation about the uh, association between uh, vascular access and survival, because I think um, I mean, we are moving toward, we certainly have had um, political and financial pressures incentivizing the use of permanent vascular access. Um, we are encouraged to try and uh, place, to make decisions about uh, dialysis, conservative care, hemo, PD, vascular access, um, uh, a year ahead of um, starting RRT or the need to start. Um, but in reality, um, as part of the Prepare for Kidney Care study, we know that most centers actually start that education at a GFR of around 20, um, and then have the decision made um, certainly well before reaching 15 mils per minute. Um, but I, th I think one of the big questions, I mean, it's, it's ob the problem with observational data is we don't know whether it's the fitter people that have the fistulas and the older, sicker, frailer people that have the lines and hence the mortality is related to the, uh, the confounding. And so I, I guess there's a, a lot of interest in the UK in, in personal choice and giving people the information to let them decide, especially the frail older people who, who have a very high mortality rate anyway, and letting them decide whether they want to have the vascular access surgery with the complications associated with that and whether there really is an increased 
uh, uh, survival if they choose to have a fistula and keep persevering at trying to have a fistula or a graft rather than that tunnel line with the very low infection rates that we have these days. Yeah. I mean, I have to re-echo that. We did a decision analysis a few years ago, which looked at costs as well as survival outcomes. And once you get into the octogenarians, there's really not much of a difference modeled out in terms of life expectancy um, or, or costs essentially across the various different access types based upon what the survival threshold is, the likelihood of success of a fistula or a graft versus a catheter. Um, as the primary two driving factors. So it largely comes down to, I think, two things. Um, one is patient preference and hopefully an informed decision. And then the second is, I think, the general impression without much data to support it, but the general impression of how someone's going to do and how long they're going to last and what their hygiene is, other factors like this that may influence the optimal vascular access choice. And Dr. Fink, can you also comment on this, please? Uh, well, I, I, I think um, uh, many of, of uh, the elderly pre-dialysis patients uh, will uh, actually never uh, start uh, uh, dialysis. And, and in, in, when thinking of that, to, to, to build a fistula two or three years uh, before dialysis uh, might be start, started can, m m might be... be uh, uh, unnecessary, so, so that's why, why I think that, that these slides are, are quite uh, popular alternatives, in, in the, especially in the elderly uh, population, because a large part of the pre-dialysis patients might, might be dying before dialysis uh, uh, ever starts. Uh, but, but in Finland, um, I know that about half of the elderly patients starts, or a little bit less than half of the elderly patients starts with, with dialysis with the fistula, and 55% and with, with um, we we with the line. I I have a question to the clinicians. I mean, um, in in all but the oldest age group, we see um, uh, a small decline in the incidence of RRT. Do you think that could have anything to do with maybe uh, a lower eGFR? Um, at the start of dialysis over the over the years, is the is the eGFR uh, declining in the last few years? eGFR at the start of the of uh, dialysis. Uh, well, um, well, what we saw after the ideal st study, the randomized study <coughs> studying uh, eG the effect of eG eGFR on 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 outcome, uh, the study was negative, negative and after that we, we saw a decrease in, in, in EGFR at start, uh, start in many, many, many countries and, and uh, once again the incidence of RRT has also um, uh, gone, gone down a little bit. Um, in, in Finland, we have also see, seen an, 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 a decrease in median EGFR at start of, of, uh, of RRT during during the past past years. <clears throat> so, in in the UK, over the last um, thirteen years, our um, percentage of patients over seventy five starting with a GFR of over ten uh, has fluctuated fairly fairly randomly between ten and twenty percent. There's no real, no real pattern, and again, this this was the stuff Steve Rosansi has been looking at, and in the US, similarly, uh, it's um, there's no real pattern. It's fluctuating. It, uh, it's gone up a bit, then gone back down, sitting around the 12 to. Uh, so no, it's a lot, it's a lot higher, but it's fairly consistent. It's around the 40 percent of people uh, um, over 75 starting with the GFR above 10, um, but no, no trend over that time. The thing is that the time frame, uh, perhaps, of starting someone with a GFR of 10 versus 7 is not 10 years. So you prolong, you, you don't prolong the duration of CKD management by all too long. It's probably a year or two, um, depending on the underlying cause of CKD and ESRD. 
but perhaps I, I think a, 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 a powerful um, tool of uh, the renal uh, registry in uh, Europe is to look at the regional variation and correlate them both with culture, which was just mentioned, whether there is a cultural difference, but also perhaps the, the, the disease, uh, disease prevalence of the underlying cause of ESRD. Is, are there patterns in that regard? Where you would see perhaps uh, your, your ESRD patient in certain countries are more the PKD overall, perhaps healthier uh, substrate versus in other countries are more diabetic and nephropathy, but perhaps issues related to access and mortality are, uh, are worse. Do you see a pattern like that in your data? Well, I, I don't know about the cultural differences. If looking at uh, Finland and Sweden, these, these are uh, countries uh, the 200 years ago were the same country and the cultural differences are not very big and still we see in the oldest population we we see that the, the incidence of RRT is, is 400 new cases per million inhabitants in Sweden and 200 in Finland and I think culture doesn't explain that uh, and actually I don't know what could explain it but if you look at countries with very high incidences of renal replacement therapy I think it might also be, be due to, to, to the healthcare system. In some countries, there are uh, private for-profit uh, units uh, with nephrologists who, 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 who make the decision about starting dialysis. If there are many, many such uh, units, it might, might affect the timing of start, start of, of, of um, dialysis. At the moment, in Finland, we have no um, for private for-profit units uh, who, who uh, make the decisions about uh, starting dialysis they are our private units providing dialysis but but uh, but the decision whether to start or not is made made in, in public hospitals i think that is an aspect that can, can explain the differences to some extent there's been a lot of questions this is Prevere from russia there's been a lot of questions on the chat in terms of incremental dialysis and, and just going over the initial powerpoint there's only six percent of those patients above 65 who started on PD, should we be pushing more PD? Is there any studies um, comparing in this patient population with incremental HD versus conventional, you know, three times a week HD? Or any thoughts on that? Um, so I can, um, a, a few comments. Um, purely opinion, but there's no reason why PD shouldn't be used far more widely in older individuals. I mean, like you said, I mean, anywhere from about six to 10% in the United States, and there's zero reason why it couldn't be two or three times that. In terms of incremental hemo, um, I, I mean, there's a lot of opinion-based literature, a little bit of observational literature that's really kind of flawed based upon you can't, the fact that you can't really match all that well, and, and I think the answer to that's really out. With PD, I mean, we almost always do start incrementally, um, because we take into account residual kidney function. At least in the U.S., we still need to meet a KT over V metric, um, regardless of what residual kidney function is for thrice-weekly dialysis. So we're disincentivized to do that, unfortunately. That's all I got. <laughs> well, I, completely, I think uh, completely agree with the PD and as, as other people in the chat are agreeing. And it just, I mean, it does, as you said, we start incrementally and just trying to, trying to get our patients to, and of course it's patient specific, try to get patients on PD more. And I think that would be more and beneficial, especially in this elderly population. Well, well my personal view, view is that I, I agree. I think uh, dialysis can be started uh, in, incrementally in the elderly population, both PD and, and hemodialysis usually. If you are treating, the, the aim of the treatment is, is quality of life. I think hemodialysis twice a week can be enough for many elderly patients and, and a, a PD with a two bag exchange per day can be enough for, for many, many patients if there is, is a, a good residual renal function. I, I do think if you're gonna start people incrementally, you need to really pay very close attention to them as their residual kidney function drops. Um, 
regardless of the modality that you're doing. It's, these things can sneak up on you and, and can be deceiving also um, in terms of what the kidney function is, even if people are still um, have a reasonable urine output. Hi, this is Anne from um, Rush. I'm one of the fellows. I have a question. Is there a frailty score? Should we be using the frailty score um, like more consistently? Is there a point where someone's frailty would point to putting someone on dialysis would cause more harm than good? Should we be calculating a frailty score like how they use with chemo, um, like where it would actually would cause more harm than good? So I just wanted to know anybody's thoughts on that. Um, I, I think that's a fantastic question. And I think that as a society in the US and I suspect everywhere else, we haven't really figured out how to approach um, the question of whether dialyzing an older person who is very frail will actually meet, allow them to better achieve whatever their goals may be. Um, and frailty, of course, is an important aspect of this. Some of the work that like Mendricrell Tamara and uh, Susan Wong have done have shown that the survival of somebody who's already in a nursing home who gets started on dialysis, the one year survival is like 10% and, and none of them, and, and, and really a handful, only a handful actually ever end up leaving a nursing home. Um, and, and that's really a, a strong marker of frailty. So yeah, I think we do have to take this into account. And I think we need better data in order to allow um, patients and, and their providers to make more informed decisions about whether or not extending life potentially with dialysis um, is part of their goals. Yeah, I, I would completely support that. I think it's a, I think there, it isn't really, in my view, it isn't really for, uh, for us to say that a certain frailty score should mean that someone doesn't get offered dialysis or it shouldn't be started on dialysis. It, we should be collecting data that describes the outcomes they can expect to experience if they choose to start dialysis or choose not to start it. And then they make a decision about their, based on their priorities and preferences. Um, so, so I think that that's, I'm happy to do with observational data. Uh, actually then, uh, going beyond that um, is, is much more difficult and, and requires, you know, requires randomization and trials. Um, and we are using a frailty score, we're using a very crude WHO frailty score um, to decide whether people are eligible for prepare for kidney care. Uh, and really, they have to spend more. The observational data on conservative care and dialysis was if you spent more than 50% of the day in a bed or chair, then you didn't appear to do better um, if you prepared for dialysis rather than preparing for conservative care. Um, but it's a very crude metric and there are much, there are much better measures of frailty out there. And I think along those lines, some, uh, you know, there's these mortality prediction tools that are there, but they're not, you know, one is based on solely a US population, the other was a French population. Uh, I think the idea is there, and if we can build on that with what you just said, Dr. Kasky, I think those are things that can definitely help inform our patients and, and let them choose the right thing as opposed to, you know, sometimes we get behind this do, 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 and more, 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 and it's not always better for the patient and their quality of life. The ERBP guidelines, which I highlighted earlier, do have um, figure one. I don't know if I'm still sharing the PowerPoint or not but um, they, they do have an algorithm which uh, shows how to assess a patient for their risk of mortality. And if they don't have a high risk of mortality, they recommend assessing for frailty as well and helping that, using that to help make the decision. But where it lacks somewhat is on, as you've all already said, is on how to assess uh, frailty and they recommend a frailty score that was introduced, I think, by uh, the, the French uh, Renal Registry. So that there is an algorithm which does include frailty, but it's not um, going to be the most easy, uh, easy algorithm to use in terms of evidence-based All right. I'd like to, oh, sorry, Dr. Cassie, go ahead. 
I was just going to say, I think the problem with all of these um, prediction models and tools is that at the population level, they may work quite well, but at the individual person in front of you level, uh, you know, the, the, the chance of predicting it incorrectly uh, is still fairly high. Uh, I can't remember the positive and negative predictive values for these things, but I, I, th I think a lot of us still feel quite uncomfortable using these scores to, to, to really guide things. I mean, they, they can push us in one direction or another, it can help with the shared decision making that we try to do, but um, uh, that's about it really. Is I don't think they should be used as cutoff points for offering people treatment. All right, well, I'd like to open up to any other questions that anyone on uh, would like to ask, ask our panelists or speaker. Um, just please feel free to unmute yourself should you have any questions. All right, and if there's no questions, uh, any other comments from our panelists today? I'd like to thank you guys all for joining us. Uh, it was excellent discussion. We appreciate you all taking time out of your out of your busy days and, and evenings to come and join us. And uh, we you know look forward to, to doing this again sometime. So thank you all. Thank you. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.